All right. Welcome back to My Life, Sam Radford. On this episode, we have a legend, an OG in the game. We have Tony Gomez, a.k.a. Madness, uh, Orlando's own. Uh, he's a legend in battle rap. He's a legend in being hilarious. He's also had some pretty cool acting gigs and some pretty cool, uh, uh, I guess you would say, projects. Um, right now, he's a father currently, uh, and uh, he's actually kind of making a little return to battle rap this summer. Thanks for being on, Madness. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on here. It's a good yep. intro. Hey, man, I try to I try to pump it up, you know? It's like right. I'm important again. Oh, you've always been important, man. <laughs> so if you're a fan of Madness before this interview, before we start off, I was actually prepping for my interview this morning and Madness in the world. I don't know why in my memory, he always talked about sandwiches. And uh, this morning, I'm like, what am I going to have before the interview? I was like, I got to get like, a fucking sandwich. And you know what, Madness? Yeah. I'm going to say... It's your fault. That sandwich was terrible, bro. <laughs> thumbs down. Thumbs down. I don't know. It's, you know, I, I could have given you some recommendations. <laughs> well, you know what? I should have taken the Cuban instead of the uh, Reuben, you know? There you go. Exactly. All right. So, Tony, man, what was it like growing up for you? I know you're in Orlando and you've based out of Orlando for a long time, but I just want to know about your upbringing. I am. Yeah, I'm from here. I'm actually from Kissimmee, which is essentially South Orlando, I guess. Just like, uh, it's kind of... If you want to think of it like whenever you have your bigger city, the section where people, when you tell them you're from there, they go, ew, it's like that. So, you know, uh, I grew up in Kissimmee. I mean, I lived in Orlando, obviously, most of my life, too. You know, it's just I cross one light and it changes the name to Orlando. Um, I guess if you want to know what Kissimmee is famous for, that movie, The Florida Project, that's Kissimmee. That's where I'm from. So they filmed that com completely in the city I'm from, just like in the little outskirts. But uh uh, you know, I grew up uh, here. I'm pretty Floridian. Like, uh, I, think, I don't think that's ever been in question for anyone that's ever met me. I didn't realize it until I started going other places that they're like, this motherfucker is out of control. And I'm like, I, this is normal for me. I'm not even the craziest person I know. But uh, I, my father's Colombian and my mother is uh, white. So I'm like coffee with cream. Nice little mix there. Uh, I grew up, you know, having immigrant family. So I kind of saw both sides the the american struggles and the immigrant struggles and things like that my father doesn't have an accent or anything he grew up in new york so it's not really like super immigrant you know but uh everyone else is for the most part um but yeah i mean that's pretty much it i just always loved hip-hop since i was a kid like it's just pretty much your standard rap like lover story like there is not like an album that slipped by me in my childhood like from the point that i knew that I could listen to this and access like CDs and cassettes because, you know, I'm old. I was like, this is what's for me, without a doubt. And then, right you know, crime and being an idiot. That's, you know, I think that's that goes hand in hand with a lot of us who are fans of that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for me, it was forced, you know, growing up as like a white kid in the suburbs, um, both, both parents white, British to the core. Uh, yeah. And, you you make yourself the one that sought out. It's not like there's the police are seeking you out. You're the one who's like, "Fuck you! I want to be oppressed. I don't know why I did it." Now I'm like, <laughs> could have spent my my teen years much better. But yeah, speaking on your with rap, um, because you're an OG with it, and you said like you never let anything slip past you. But what was that first moment where you it know clicked? I was trying to think of it right because I, I I listened to your kid twist one recently, and I'm like, you know, he he had Eminem, but I was before that, that would have been like 98, right? When that came out. So I'm like, like in 93, late 92, that's what would have been like my era of like, I guess when you're like end of elementary, you guys call it elementary school? Yeah. Uh, end of elementary school, into middle school, like that time period where those things you listen to and that you like are going to be the most classic thing to you for the rest of your life, right? So during that period, it would have been like, Wu-Tang, you know what I mean? Like early Nas, Mob Deep, everyone in the 93, 94 on era. And like 95 would be like the pinnacle of rap for me in my memory. You know, oh, someone five years older than me might go like 88 or something like that, but that's before my time. But like 95 is the year that like, I think is the greatest year in hip hop. But I would say like, I mean, if I had to pick somebody, it would have been like Wu-Tang, you know, just like everyone else. No one had ever heard any shit like that before. And, you know, I was getting into a lot of fights and I also really like nerd shit. So it was like exactly that. It's like hood ass mentality and raps mixed with like nerdy comic references and things 
of that nature and movies and which is everything I'm into. So I'm like, I love this, you know, this is perfect. And I, I was wearing hoodies all the time. I looked like I was an extra member of Wu-Tang. Yeah, man. No, that's, that's a cool reference. You said it too. I think like it shapes a lot of us on um, the references within the music we listen to. So like I grew up shamefully now, like looking back, I thought they were like the best, but like, they're still great in my mind, but like Jedi mind tricks and stuff yeah, yeah, of course. used to always have amazing basketball references. Like we buck, like we Michael red or like even like <laughs> a hockey one, like we put fire on ice, like flames in Calgary. Like that's the kind of shit I love gravitating to. So I understand like if you're a, guy who's into fighting and all that kind of stuff you're going to gravitate to. i wasn't really into fighting i was just a knucklehead but <laughs> it's just you know i i really liked more aggressive hip-hop like there's certain i don't want to call it softer rap that came out at the time that i just was not into at all like that was very much the hard stuff that you know was on the radar and and here here might be a little different than a lot of places. I mean, nowadays you might have more of a mix like Atlanta might be like here where like uh, people are from here. Like I'm born and raised here, but my parents aren't from here. Just like most everyone else isn't from here, right? Everyone's a transplant from the Northeast. So my entire like elementary, middle and high schools were filled with majority people from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you know what I'm saying? So they're like everyone's cousin, and all my cousins live up North, you know? So it's like everyone's bringing stuff that you might not get elsewhere right so i had a direct connection to like things that released that people in only in new york would have heard or something like that like mixtapes and things like that. i had doo-wop and tony touch mixtapes and you named the dj i had the mixtapes right so we just had a direct connection with the northeast so it kind of like gave us everything all, basically in real time right so it kind of helped like advance my love for hip-hop because i wasn't really trying to have to seek out too many things uh, and, you know, until the internet started popping. And then I was just like, well, now you can just order anything from hip hop site or sandbox. And I spent all my money. It's funny looking back for me, cause I'm, I'm younger, obviously is just, uh, I don't know if you remember it when Netflix used to be like a vending machine outside of stores and you'd buy a Netflix CD, like no in way. Canada, at least like before Netflix was a streaming platform, you would just buy a Netflix CD for like six bucks and you return it to this vending machine. It was wild. What? Just, That's just what Redbox is now. Do they just steal Netflix platform? <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, man. So uh, before we get into battle rap and everything else, I want to talk to you about a random memory that I have. Um, I remember I used to always creep all you guys on Facebook as a fan, right? Um, and <laughs> and you've been on there and forever. I think like everyone's just phased it out. Of I never made it to Twitter. I'm like I'm like this guy who's stuck. Uh, Dude, I have an iPhone six. Um, Facebook is just like everyone you went to school with that never did anything with their life, recycling like dumb ideas that to other dumb people that didn't do anything with their lives. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, it hurt. I'm just kidding. Um. But so you, the only reason I say that is you have a. a picture of you from probably the 90s with a pace swan shirt on and pace oh, yeah. one of my favorite rappers so i always like had a little more respect for you because that because like a lot of not a lot of people talk about him but i think like the the green the with him and mr green's one of my favorite albums ever wow. and like and but see i only got into him in the mid 2000s so pace one must have been around forever right Absolutely, so when man. when did the outsiders, you start the outsiders were it's one of those stories that especially if you've seen groups blow up and not and not right like they had everything possible that should have had them blow up. And it's just, I guess it's just unlucky story or something like that. But I was a big Outsiders fan. And funny enough, a huge Eminem fan on the side too, because they, they were in you know a group together. Um, and Pace One, I guess him and Young Z were kind of the four front members of the Outs, right? So um, and for those that don't know, the Outs are from Newark, New Jersey, right? The Eminem's one of his first crews outside of Dirty Dozen and whatnot, but they had a very distinct, like stretched out punchline-y style. And for my age at that time, right, they were, they were popping about like 98 also, like right around when Eminem was getting, getting super famous for his first album, his first official album. I have the Slim Shady EP also, but uh, uh, they went on tour with him and, I went to that show. It was Eminem, The Outsiders, and The Beat Nuts, which are just like three of my favorites ever. The Beat Nuts, probably top two groups for me ever, right? But uh, 
That's actually the shirt that Pace One was wearing. And he threw it into the crowd and I got it. Not to say, yo, I'm wearing this dude's shirt that he wore. But, you know, at the time, you're really into hip hop. I rapped, but I wasn't on that level. Of course, these guys are like gods to me in the rap world. Because especially, I thought Pace One was an amazing rapper. Still is. And uh, him and Z. And, you know, who else was up there? I think it was like Yaya, ya, ya, which I got, I'll, I'll transition to that story in a second. But uh, I want to say Rod Digger was with them too, because she's an outsider. Um, damn, As Is was up there. Just the, the whole crew. I mean, there's like 10 of them on stage and they all rap just as good as the other guys. Like perfect. But yeah, huge Outsiders fan. Um, and then fast forward years later, just many years later, uh, this is like late 2000s, maybe 07 or 08, maybe. Uh, Yaya from The Outsiders, who's Young Z's brother, who kind of missed out on a lot of the releases they had because he had gone to prison. Uh, he moves to Orlando and we just somehow, me and Critical and him, just somehow connect and we just become friends. And we just record like a bunch of songs together. I learned a lot of recording, about recording from him, like stretching out your flow, and I just watch him control his breath. And he was such a dope rapper. Even though the outs didn't even get like their due, Ya really didn't get his due, like as one of the prominent members. But uh, he actually linked me up with Young Z when I was in New York. And I went over to Newark and I Z picked me up. We went to Newark and I recorded a song with Z. And that was like, that's my outsider's connection right there. <laughs> that's so cool, man. That's Long winded such a good... story. No, but bro, I that's... thought it was just a wild connection because I'm a huge outsider's fan, man. No, dude, that's that's so like that's such a cool story, and and I probably like the first time you're premiering that story. And also, I forgot to say in my intro, I I I try to think, try to say that I'm a good person with intros, but he's also one half of Critical Madness. Two thirds if you count my weight, but you know. Uh, <laughs> but before we get before we get into that, uh, just because the Beat Nuts reference, it's hilarious. Like your favorite rappers are my favorite rappers say akabo is like one of my favorite songs with method oh, yeah. man and that's a crazy crossover with wu-tang right like yeah. oh i love the beat nuts man like no escape in wow. this the the, wow. the song with big pun is like one of my favorite like yeah, bar books, for absolutely. oh my god just yeah, i've amazing. been a huge beat nuts fan since their second album which would have been like the 93 94 era too i can't remember the exact year maybe 92 but uh they just their production style when it switched to more of like the I don't want to call it goofy but or cartoony but like those kind of samples that's when it was a rap like their style was so different from everyone else's like especially on the stone crazy album which would have been like off the books and all you know uh uh oh shit what's the other song uh do you believe which was the first song i heard from that album and that's that beat is so hard the beats are insane for those like like off the books like did it did it it's it's one of those ones that's always going to be memorable to me oh everything man everything and then uh we got to do a show with them too which is a huge moment in my life too and uh when we we got to we rocked before them obviously they were the headliner they performed here in orlando and uh juju from the beat nuts he goes yo shout outs to critical madness the new beat nuts and i was just like yo pick my head up off the floor it's over like that's wild man best moment of my life well especially with like the spanish rap connection too right what, what i loved with the beat nuts was it was so heavy with this with the spanish like and they always collaborated with all the different artists too which was oh yeah like, Unless very it's awesome colombian like me so it's like you know you're not necessarily always looking for someone that's the same race or nationality as you or whatever but when you see someone that is, right? Because there was none, there's no other Colombians in rap at that time that I knew of, AL, but I don't even know if you know who that is, but he's also associated with the Beat Nuts, so really. <laughs> but uh, you're just like, damn, there's a Colombian dude out there that's been doing it forever. And you're like, I could do this shit. <laughs> No, 100%, bro. The, the worst for me was when I had my little stint in battle rap. The first battle I ever won, I used to be skinny. And um, uh, I remember I won the battle and somebody in the crowd was like, way to go, Asher Roth. And I was like, fuck, this is who I'm compared to. <laughs> there was a good period of battle rap when you got stopped call being called Eminem and then you became Asher Roth. They got a tiny period, you know what there I mean? There was also but a long period, which I don't think it ever ended, that if you rapped and you weren't black, you sound like Eminem to every like white girl you were like oh you remind me of eminem it's like bitch i don't fucking sound like eminem at all <laughs> it's the worst thing in the world and also because like you meet people uh, and introduce himself oh i also do like rap battles oh so you're white so you, eminem's your favorite rapper right like yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you gotta <laughs> that's like forever now i mean it's opened up a lot more like you know when eminem came out there was 
no uh, there was white rappers but there was no other white rapper like that on the level which you know so it was like shout out know, to the white rapper the show i opened yeah the white rapper ah <laughs> oh, shout out to mc search he lives that's here what also. i yeah so that's what i was gonna lead to like isn't that hilarious like that's who i knew before eminem but the, that show was a debacle that's one of my favorite things to watch man yeah that show uh somebody i know got offered a chance to be on it and they were like they were kind of looking at like the layout in advance and they were like nah I don't think I should do that. He was like a hood ass white dude too that I know from here. He's got like a scar on his neck from being stabbed. And I'm like, he's like, I think they're going to try to play me. And I'm like, I don't know, man. That's why like, you should do it. It's going to be on TV. Well, I think through one battle rap connection or something, if I might be mistaken, you can tell me if I'm wrong or if you even know, but I think a girl on that show was this girl named Persia. Who's from, from yeah, like Persia, Rockaway, yeah. Rockaway uh, in yeah, New York. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So there we go. There was a, there's always a connection, right? Yeah. Um, so let's start. I don't on know that. her, but uh, no, yeah, she's a- I just I just knew the name and the face because I remember when Sarah Connor was starting like a, a women rap battle league that didn't really pop oh, off. That, yeah, that there, we, was- there was like the little era there. Um, but anyway, Not Sarah Connor, I know Sarah Connor too. Oh, gee, uh, you're always in the cut in those in the the New York videos and everything. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Um, um, yeah, John Brown though, I think that's who everyone remembers from uh, White Rapper <laughs> Show. That's Hallelujah, my. Hallelujah, holla back. Isn't I mean, as dumb as people wanted to say it was, and it was very dumb, everything that he said, but uh, it sticks with you. I, I, I still know, like good marketing. Good I marketing. can't believe like you said that. And I'm like, fuck, I think of that all the time. Hallelujah, all about. It's one of those things you say, hallelujah, think of that. No, but, but uh, I see MC Search here. Like I've seen him around a bunch and he's friends with my friends. Like I had dinner with him. Like <laughs> That's so wild. Cool, yeah. That's so cool. Um, so let's get in before, like, let's get into battle rap for a bit. For like, a, a lot of my fans are ma- based on battle rap. It's funny that people hit me up. A guy, before we get into talking about you and the WRCs um, and your freestyle come up, uh, I had a guy hit me up the other day who was the runner of the Adelaide WRC 2007 bracket. And he was like, Hey, man, fan of your show. And I was like, What a crazy, weird world we live in, you know? And, um, but yeah, so before we get into modern battle rap and WRCs, uh, his name is Craig Bass. Oh, okay. He lives in Canada now, ironically. Oh, um, nice. But uh, so what was it like for you freestyling coming up? And how did you first get into like battling? Like, after just like you said, you rapped and you loved these shows. What was like your first? Was it like a lunchroom setting? Was it like a cipher at a party? Uh, yeah, it would have been more like a lunchroom setting, right? It was, I was very into hip hop, which, you know, I explained like a little fangirl at the beginning of this, but uh, I always wanted to rap, right? I, I watched all these videos. I remember there was, this is really going to date me. And also, I, I was still a little kid, but I don't even, you might not even know about this. There was supposed to be this battle on like pay per view back in the, mid 90s or somewhere maybe like 95 and it was like the dog pound versus somebody i can't even remember and i remember seeing that on tv and i was like oh shit they're gonna like battle each other and i'm like man that's awesome and i was just obsessed with like competition i love sports uh any i love trivia i like try to demolish people in trivia like just very competitive nature i also just love making music too but uh freestyling was the thing freestyling was huge in florida actually which i didn't really know that i was participating in like this bigger scene at the time right because you're just trying to do it and then you realize there's other guys like gin and recognize like from south florida right they're only like three hours away from me but you just realize that other guys are doing it on the same level that you're doing it even though obviously they're way more famous than me now but shouts to them uh well, you know, just to be in the lunchroom, it was very hard to battle people back then or just to even be freestyling with someone because not everyone rapped. It wasn't like now or even like 10 years ago where it's like you throw a stone and you hit 70 rappers, you know, it's me and like three other kids in my entire school and they're not battle rappers. So I like kind of had a friend who rapped and in class, we would like write battles on the page and send them back and forth. And then at lunch, we would just freestyle all the time. And I would just try to get whoever thought they could rap even the most minuscule amount. I'd be like, fuck it, just get them over here. I just need to get this off. And uh, I think it's pretty apparent. I'm just good at shitting on people like personality wise. So I'm pretty quick witted. My friends are ruthless my entire life. Like they just, if you have an accomplishment and you're here, they're going to make sure they put you back down here like fast. So you always had to be quick with it. And I just transferred that into rhyme form. Uh, you know, 
obviously writing music's a whole different monster, right? You, you're trying to cover concepts and be emotional and, and everything, but yeah, freestyling just got into it in middle, not middle school, in high school. And then I would say it really materialized uh, my first year of college. I went to the University of Central Florida. I'm walking through the student union, which is, you know, like just the main area. And this guy who I'd eventually become friends with as well, his name's Santiago Skills. He's a DJ. He hands me this flyer and he says, hey, there's going to be this uh, <laughs> freestyle battle, you know, and I'm pretty seasoned at freestyling with my friends and stuff. So I'm, he's like, this is freestyle battle on Friday in front of the student union. I will be DJing out there. Uh, you should come out. And I looked at the flyer and I look, I don't even know this guy. I looked at the flyer and I looked at him. I'm like, all right, cool, man. I'm gonna fucking win that shit. And he was just, he was just like stunned. And I was, I was so arrogant back then. Like, yeah, not in a bad way, but just in the like, I'm gonna kill this. You know what I mean? No one can do better than me. So that I, I told my boy, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna enter this. We should go, you know. Friday rolls around. Uh, they've got this whole tent set up, like hundreds of people in front of the student union freestyle battle like you know you used to have to sign up because it's freestyle right you didn't know who you were battling in advance i signed up and from like the first two battles it was very clear that nobody battled like me like this is i hate even being like oh i'm so good but it was the skill difference was very apparent immediately where they were just like yeah you got a car and I'll see you at the bar. And you're just like, ooh. And in my mind, I'm like just formulating like 20 lines. But uh, anyway, skip to the end. Clean sweep, just destroyed it. Met so many people who would further my connections to rap in the city, like just from that. But I had gone to freestyle battle competitions before that. I had gone to the Pro-Am in Miami, which is a huge hip hop festival and whatnot. And I had watched battles, right? Live ones. And you know, I'd, I'd have like my older cousin or somebody try to nudge me like, yo, you should get in that. And I'm like, nah, I don't think I'm ready, which I, I don't think I was. But like we had battles here called Quest, which were a huge battle. My man, Czar, he killed one of those, right? He don't even battle anymore, but he was killing it. Rugged, you might've known Rugged yep. early prime time days. He was killing it in those freestyle battles too. But I just, I don't, they're like two or three years older than me. I, I feel like, I needed those couple of years to like really be ready. And then that UCF battle in front of the student union just mowed everybody down, like not even close, like did my best to be funny and hurtful at the same time and kind of noticed, hey, I might have something here that I could actually keep going instead of it just being fun with people I know around the way. So 100%. That no, it's, I like that. No. And you know, for me, it was actually different because like I didn't. In high school, like, especially like where I grew up, like there is no rap, but there's no good ones. Right. And you do it by yourself. And right. for me, as such a big rap fan. You're so critical of yourself. Right. So like, I never like rapped in front of people. I was like on my webcam in my mom's office or like, um, <laughs> I didn't even have that option. <laughs> <laughs> see, And so, but dude, see, the funny thing is like the first time I did it, I like in front of people was a battle. And then the first yeah. like reaction you get is like a fucking high that you just want to chase the rest of your life, you know? Oh, um, yeah. But I'm sure you probably already had that high because you were already freestyling in, in school and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was freestyling with anyone that would rap with me. I mean, so this is since middle school. Yeah. Uh, and like freestyling, not battling, like one-on-one -on -one competition style. But yeah, me and my man Jesse and my man Rob from around the way, uh, we would just get up every day because we all lived in like pretty much walking distance from each other in the same block. So we would all get up maybe Jesse's house or Rob's house and just freestyle the day away i have old cassettes recorded of just me as a little kid with these dudes just freestyling for hours we put on like a whole instrumental album and just like go through it like a mixtape of instrumentals and use the karaoke feature that's my webcam the karaoke feature <laughs> on the stereo to like go through and uh you know record these freestyles for like 90 minutes you know and we'd have to flip the tape over to continue freestyling so ridiculous my it's brother so would come in and drop stupid comments on it. I love those tapes. Those tapes are mad fucking funny. It's dude. That's yeah. like that's that's like the pure form, right? Like that's when you're still like you're you're like you're so young in it. Like well, my difference because obviously uh more modern, but 
I had a shitty MP3 player, like one of those ones that looked like lipstick. And yeah. I would have my mom's computer speakers and I'd put a beat on and I'd have to do the whole entire song. And I thought like recording meant you had to rap every single thing and the hook. And if I fucked up, re-record it all. And then I remember my first studio session, I spit my first four and the guy's like, okay, stop. Now overlay it. And I'm like, what the fuck is this, man? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Let's go through the whole thing first. <laughs> um, so what was it like for you? You were in the WRCs with Critical in New York. I had first, I want to just talk about what that experience was like, but also um, with the kid twist episode, he spoke about the venue. They did it in, in, Tor in Toronto and they, all they did was get fed pizza and Red Bull. And oh, they, it's and accurate. They, I listened to it. It's yeah. Accurate. So what was your, what was the whole experience like with all of that? It's kind of like think, a long, I think all the WRC 2007 battlers like have this special bond of having the longest fucking day of their entire life rapping and just, it almost, I could almost see it ruining battling for a few people, like not me, but it, like definitely a couple were just like, I never want to do this again. But uh, we were, ours was in the, in the Bronx um, and I had to fly up there because I lived here in Florida and Critical, who is, he's from Brooklyn originally, uh, you know, Italian kid from, from Bensonhurst. He moves to Florida and, at a young age, which is just the story of mostly everyone here. Uh, and then he moved back to New York at that time. And uh, he was just like, yeah, I'm gonna try to, you know, get music stuff done up there and things like that. He's like, plus, plus I'm from here. So it kind of just makes sense. He enters us into this competition without even telling me. So if you watch like the prelims, it's just him versus two people all the, like the whole way. And I'm like, <laughs> I watched him and he kills it. Like, he's great. He, Critical is way better freestyler than me. Maybe not like uh, like a technical freestyler, right? I'm more of like personality, punchy stuff like that. But technical freestyles, he's amazing still. And uh, he enters us, he he kills it. And like, I think we were a shoe in I don't know if that's true, but I, I like to let a guy enter as one person and his partner's not even here. Like you just kind of knew who I was. I forgot how they knew us already, but uh, I think Harry was just like, cool, you know, just entered, you know, we'll record it, whatever, whatever. So I fly up there to do it after we're already in from the prelims and we get to the Bronx and, you know, he lived in Brooklyn. So we, you know, we took the train. Uh, I get there. And first of all, all the rappers are outside. You can always find a rap venue by 70 guys standing outside of a door. Like if you're ever looking for the place, you don't have to look beyond that. Cause that's the place. But I see disaster out there. I've never met disaster. Uh, and he's in the New York one because he's not in the LA one. So I actually, I mean, me and Disaster go way back to that. And there's a couple other people out there, Cyanides out there, killing them in Tahoe, shouts to them. Uh, and we, it's like the venue is like upstairs. So it's like one of those, um, I don't know how much city life is near you, but like a downtown area where you know, it's just a thin staircase up to like this little open room. It looked like a dance studio. They told me it was a studio, but I don't think they specified. I think it was a dance studio because it had a big mirror on the wall and the floor was all wooden, you know, like that light wood. And I'm like, okay. And then you weren't allowed to bring like uh, friends or like people to watch it. You could bring one. So we brought my boy, Ben, uh, who was Critical's roommate also. Uh, shout out to Getty Free. And uh, ah, man, it's just, you want me to just break down the whole day, how grueling of an experience it was? <laughs> Yeah. And first, I want to tell you that I live in Ottawa. We have almost a million people. So, yeah. Yeah, but I don't know what your downtown <laughs> oh, city is like, oh, it's right? Not, our downtown Ottawa Some sucks. cities aren't Ottawa. like New York City, right? No, no, I know what you mean. So you're probably in like a, a shitty loft that's probably just fucking heat going through everything, I'm guessing. Well, it's just... It, it's i want to say it was in the winter too because oh really that. see that's the one thing i don't know about um time with wrcs right because yeah, I, only, I gotta like, look back no nah, it might have been summer because i was wearing like a stupid like baby blue shirt with short sleeves but we ended up battling on the roof right in the second half which we were almost at the roof anyway so it wasn't like that much of a trip up there a roof with a fucking human-sized hole in it mind you that was like blocked off like you couldn't walk to that section so we were in the perfect spot in the Bronx, but uh, yeah, it was 
It was so grueling, and there was just pizza and Red Bull from all I remember. I don't remember anything else. Luckily, it's New York, so, you know, you can walk down the street and get a sandwich. So we walked, you know, to like a bodega and got some food at some point. That was a mistake. Uh, I think anyone who's ever tired, if you eat, you're just done. Your day is over, right? So the second half, I think the first, they might have released them out of order, but the first few battles of our second half, I just look like I'm dying because I was, right? I'd say we probably spent 13 hours there, 14 hours or something. And it's just just to pick up and piggyback off of what Kid Tiss was saying. It's like they really did try to treat it like a, you know, uh, a television series or, or uh, a film set. And you're just waiting most of your day. And that was just so grueling, man, because you battle once and you're amped to do your battle and you're freestyling. And you get it over with, and then you're like, all right, here goes five other battles until you can battle again. And you just, you know, rinse and repeat. So that part of it really wore us down. And uh, I still loved it. You know, shouts to Harry. Definitely one of the, this sounds so corny, but one of the jump off points for modern battling, without a doubt. Like that, without that, you don't have all these people meeting everyone else because I go, Hey, Lush One, I'm Madness from WRCs. I'm moving out to the Bay. Are you happen to know any battle stuff going on? Yeah, actually, Grind Time, which is from Orlando, is expanding out here. And I'm throwing an event, Battle of the Bay, and I think you versus Thesaurus would be a good headliner, right? So it's, it's really crazy how you just tie everything back to the, the jump off scene, you know? Of course, Smack era, they kind of were their own separate entities, but there's still a lot of crossover, right? Because everybody knows someone from both sides. 100% no. And that's like, if you think about it too, it's funny. Because like, as a fan, I've just known it all for so long. But if you look at like, basically you said there's a few people that left, right? But if you look mm -hmm. at modern battle rap, everybody from WRC was in it. Even like, even though Awkward's wasn't battling, I think he used to I, do like weekly judgments or like, yeah, like exactly. line yeah, of the week. there. It's wild what, cause like, and, and I think it's a, it's good and bad, right? Like they were an organization, but they weren't that organized. So I think battle rappers kind of saw what you needed to do to, cause like, and there was the whole elements league thing that was going on in Nova Scotia that was already a league, but like, you know, that's when grind time. So, and it's, it's crazy to think of that crossover. So before we talk about grind time, um, well, what, I was going to say awkwards too is before he was higher reason. Yeah. What's that? Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to talk about Scribble Jam. My bad. No, 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 no. I was going to say Awkwards was as soon as I moved to the Bay, or which would be, you know, San Jose, San Francisco area for anyone that's not familiar with the, the Bay in California, uh, Bay Area. But awkward. I reached out to Awkwards because I, I had some songs that I had to finish and I didn't get to finish them before I left Florida. So I was like, hey, do you know anyone with a studio out here in San Jose where I'm living? Uh, and he said, yeah, he's like, let me link you up with these guys, Skylar G and Dirtbag Dan. These are my boys that live in San Jose. And like, that's how I meet them. And then I know Skylar and Dan from around my way because they live 10 minutes from me. You know what I'm saying? But I meet them because I know awkwards from WRCs. He links me with them fucking it's such a small world it's so that's what's so cool with it right like i always my reference that i always do to like talk is like i knew a girl who battled or i and don't flop there was a girl that battled and like you know they always show you where they're from and then i went to meet my granddad in england for the first time and i told myself sam this is the first time in years you're not going to smoke weed you know what i mean yeah. first day and i'm like i need to get weed so i hit this girl up and then boom get weed just based off battle rap you know there you go. <laughs> yeah it really connects you to people man it's wild. And like to, to this day too, right? Like people like, like I, I, I was, a, it was, there was a whole era with you in Oakland, but before we get to that, um, underground sessions was a DVD, I think. Right. Yep. And so where, what was the timeline between um, like WRCs and grind time with you did battles underground sessions. You battled probably at the time, one of the most known battlers in the world, iron Solomon. Um, I really, you know, when I battled him, I don't think he was as known yet. He was okay. like right on the cusp because he had just changed his name from AM Boogie to Iron Solomon. So they kind of gave me the rundown of him beforehand. I'm freestyling, right? So I'm just like, just tell me a couple things about him and I'll formulate a couple lines in here. But uh, my man, uh, Bal and Real Six, they were the ones who did underground sessions. They were just kind of, um, I don't know if they, you know, there was a lack in, in smack releases or something, but battle rap was starting to get really popular. 
And of course, it's always been popular in the streets anyway, right? So Real Six knew, he, was the, he filmed them all, Critical. Um, I don't know if they were roommates at the time. They might've been roommates already, but he was like, hey, I'm filming this. You should come out and just freestyle or whatever. And we both battled and uh, I ended up battling Iron Solomon because they were like, hey, we got this guy. We were in like Times Square in like an alley somewhere. And they filmed them all there. And shout outs to Iron Solomon, man, because number one, way ahead of the game writing beforehand, which I was so not naive, but you know, you're coming off of the era of freestyling where writing is frowned upon and you're like, I can't do that. But he had so much good shit prepared. Like, I mean, it was clearly polished, very good, murdered me. Uh, in my opinion, murdered me. But that battle, I swear to God, is the most I get talked to about any battle I've ever done. And it's almost every time that people tell me that that's the first battle they ever saw, which sure. is sure. wild to me because I'm so whack in that battle. <laughs> but it's such a hidden gem. I love gem. that battle. Like, did you watch it? Because I watched it. I but, was there. But you're, you're, But the thing is, too, what I think um, with you, especially when there is that whole thin line between people who are writing and freestyling in that time, yeah. is like the reason you still, like in my eyes, were so good in that and in all of your battles even if you don't have written, you're always a good freestyle and your punchlines are great. As you said earlier, like you're great at roasting people and shit. Like at the end of the day, like you don't even really need to rhyme sometimes for people to react off it because of how, but the thing is with you, you do. So like, Oh man, it, I totally got away with so many stuff, especially in the freestyle era where I'm just like, you just throw a little extra mustard on a line. You know what I mean? And oversell it and it gets a good reaction. And in your head, in my head, I'm just like, Man, I just stole that laugh, baby. Like the Los <laughs> Angeles, he was in your Iron Solomon battle. He had an, a Los exactly, Angeles. Exactly, dude. That's not even like that's so <laughs> terrible. Yeah, looking back, I'm like, probably when I was 14, I probably fucking loved that line, you know. <laughs> but again, you know, freestyling. I'm not gonna hit a nice 16 bar rhyme in a freestyle. So you go with what you got. I can't believe that many people love that battle. I love from those underground sessions, Critical versus Shirt and Tie. I think that battle is amazing. And I think Critical murdered that shit. And that is true good freestyling. And it's a what, so what, um, why did Critical never go on to the modern form? Was it because he was more of a purist with the freestyle and then the music was for his? Yeah, you can stop okay. right there. That's exactly it. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> yep. As is, no, I will never write a, uh, I will never write a verse and read it to another man. <laughs> like, <laughs> all right, man. Cool. I'll do it. Yeah, it's like my older brother when he when he was like saw that I was doing battles and watching music. Like, it's crazy, man. I would just want to punch the guy in the fucking face. <laughs> and yeah. I'm just, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's always gonna be that. But you know what's so funny too, man, is yeah, yeah, there might be some animosity between a few battlers here and there, but there's really only so many other guys that understand your perspective in this subculture. So <laughs> really, you're battling one of the small percentage in the world that knows what you went through to make this work. So, you know. It's, yeah, like, there's just that level of respect always. Of course, you know, a lot of them, you're going to come off like you hate them. And some people really do hate each other and they battle each other. But I'm always of the mindset where, like, if I hate you, like, I'm not going to write about you. I just fucking punch you in the face. Like, yeah. we're going to skip three months of trying to come up with witty punchlines. Well, but, that's, uh, that's Yeah, I mean, it really that. comes down to that. It's just, you know, you're really... It, the The idea of someone who's outside of it seeing it that way makes sense because they don't get that you're on the inside of this culture that not everyone understands how it works oh it was so nice finding other battle fans growing up because like you're trying to show somebody you show your friends who they might like rap or something but like and they've they have no they've never seen and you're like yo that was crazy and they're just kind of look at you like what did they just do there like what mm -hmm. what wh why is the double entendre that cool to you <laughs> like you know uh, but um all right so freestyle battles that i really liked was like uh our battlers loved supernatural okay uh, and then i think this is probably a lot of people my age or around my age uh juice versus eminem that is just like was it rapbattles.com or battlerap.com something back then i think it was rapbattles.com the one that had the two yellow faces yelling at each other with a mic yeah anyway that site, I found it somehow because clearly I was searching for battles, but they had the audio from the Rap Olympics and it was Juice versus Eminem and, or Juice versus Supernat too. 
Uh, wait, did you just battle Eminem? They did battle, yeah, right? Yeah, did. That's that. That's okay. that. That I think yeah. it was the '99 or '98. Okay, because like I'm that. like yeah. in my head, I'm like, eh. but then they no, had he did, yeah. Super Nat too, and I was just like, you know, listen to the audios on Real Player or whatever the hell they had back then to listen to it, and uh, I was just blown away that like this is how people freestyle. So that's another reason that you kind of, or me personally, was like I have to up my game. But I, I always was unique in a personality sense like there's not a lot of people i met that are like me so i would always put my own spin on things which i think always benefited me in the long run yeah and that's why i think that's a big thing with battle rap too is like for me i loved it for the characters you, you know what you're getting out of this certain person just like i'm a huge basketball fan. It's like yeah. i know like the other night like last night donovan mitchell dropped 45 fucking insane and but then right. like also i love seeing somebody have like a 20 rebound night you know what i mean like you love yeah. people for who they are and what they do like i'll always love nate robinson in the knicks even though the knicks oh suck. yeah yeah you know magic, um, they're going all the way what br- <laughs> what what I was, I was confused for a second maybe they're think still in it <laughs> you didn't know dude i'm a raptors right fan there, look bam <laughs> there you go whatever bro bright future you know you got yeah, uh, you greg know, anthony's I kid build, i guess yeah uh, i lived in california when they lost to the lakers oh my god that hurt that must have been tough but that was a really good team though and i think people don't talk about how like they don't talk about the modernization of the game. Like they speak about Phoenix Suns and Golden State, but like Orlando was fucking three and D to the core. Like at Dude. that point, like it was insane, man. It was all and three and D players. I know they lost four one, but I don't think people really realize how close every game was. Like mm-hmm. they lost one game on a missed alley oop and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like everything was like within two, except one. They got blown out in one game, but you know, just wasn't meant to be. And that was, uh, you know, one of the great Laker wins. It's really funny you say that because like I'm a, I'm a weirdo dude. I was looking at um, Basketball Reference the other day, and I was literally looking at Hito Turkoglu's career, and he has his best two years in in Orlando. And what Toronto does is we we take him, we think we tell all the fans he's going to be great, and then he gets goes down from 16 points per game to 10, and then he goes wow. to Phoenix, and then he goes back to Orlando. He was on fire. Austin was on fire. Jameer Nelson, I think, was the part was. It, it's not that Jameer Nelson wasn't good. It's that he had been out too long and they tried to shoehorn him back in, in the finals. And I think it just threw off the chemistry of what they had going. What was, I recently heard about Jameer Nelson's college years and like how he was in like one of the best, like backcourts in college at the time. Well, um, I'll tell you what, I, in any sport, my college knowledge is like 1%. <laughs> bro, if you don't have the player's name on the back of the Jersey, I can't really follow it that well. <laughs> oh, man, it's like, it's like college I like football players. It's like, I'll tell you everything I'm in the NFL, but if it comes down to like their college years, I'm like zero clue. Man. I find there's different people. I, I'm not a big bet guy. So I've never been a March madness or like a college basketball. Like, yes. Some, same. Sometimes I know it, but it's like from reading slam magazines. That's it, man. Like yeah. that's about it. But um, I think, yeah, I think it really does come down to betting for a lot of people because they're running like brackets and things like that, where they have to know where it's like, if you play fantasy football, right. You have to know what every player is doing because it affects your fantasy team. So it just forces you to learn more than you would normally. So I think, yeah, a lot of that plays into the college knowledge, which I just don't have. Oh, my first year playing fantasy basketball was 2016. And I thought it was like playing 2K. So you just had people that were good. So I picked Vince Carter first overall, not knowing that it was day to day. (laughs) Oh yeah. Cause then you cover in like the whole season. I can't even imagine people playing fantasy baseball. Like what is wrong with you? Like that's just weird. How much do you have that much time in your life? You must not, <laughs> All right, you, must not get, you must not get laid. Um, but if you do, shout outs to you. Uh, when you went to, oh, you went to San Jose. Um, yep. So you went to San Jose and then you battled the Saurus for your first grind yeah. time battle. And what was we the had timing? Just battled before that though. At lounge battles that, uh, yeah. that shout out to, oh my God, how am I? Are you talking about Matt Hills? Yes. Shout out to Matt Hills for lounge battles. That was <laughs> something that was, I always knew about. And like, it seemed to be kind of like, as you said, like you meet people and everything and you already battled the source. Yeah, it was, so an me, it was a rematch here that they ran. And, uh, you know, it would just be at one event a year. All right. I got to get more water. I'm like choking here for real. Yo, it's all good, man. Do you want me to pause quickly? <laughs> I'll pause. Part out. All right. We're back. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that. Just, no, don't worry about it. it. Felt like I ate a pack of Marlboro reds or something. It's all good, man. Well, look how red I look around camera right now. Um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, with the source, it was your rematch. 
Um, we shout out to Lounge Battles. That was yeah, in a different setting. Um, right? Because so Lounge Battles would have been more of a freestyle. Freestyle. On stage and, then- and when it was still kind of freestyle, right? Because like still, I think the first grind time event there was like half the people. The people who did well were the ones that pre that pre wrote a lot of because there was some that were like major fall off. So were like people freestyled and they didn't know it was like written. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I what mean, was I it was like- always aware of like the written style, which would have been like you know more of the smack and the street stuff like that. We always had the DVDs, like I said. Anything from New York was alive here, so I had access to all of it through anybody. There was whole stores dedicated to mixtapes and DVDs and whatnot. But um, I had done one written battle event here and killed it. And this is, I don't think I ever said this here. Uh, I battled my verse. Uh, Really? Yeah, that was our first battle, I think, ever. Was this when she was still a model? For Grind Time's website? She, no, this is before Grind oh, this Time. Before, my, this bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. This is she was uh she's a poet, which I think everyone knows, but yes. she's doing she did both, right? She rapped and does poetry. And I think I don't know why she entered, but you know, she rapped and we pre-wrote because the, the event was just called Written's with a Z, I'm pretty sure. Uh and I think it was also put on by Matt Ills, but uh yeah, I battled her at the event. It was like you battled, it was still structured like a freestyle battle event where it's rounds. Like I battle this person round and this person round. So I had to memorize stuff for three or four people. But yeah, I bought a her, dude named King Koopa, which I think his name was Jargonist back then. And dude named Dirty Dem, who Just later Dirty I also Dem. found out is also Colombian, which I called him like Mexican that whole battle, which is hilarious and ironic. But I think he used yeah. to do the graphics for Grind Times. He did, and he actually has a company, man, uh, Mightier Than Co., which he's a super dope graphic artist, um, and he's he's out in like Seattle now. But uh, yeah, so against Thesaurus the first time on stage lounge battles, I had I didn't write, but I had you know what do they call them pre meds or whatever back then, a couple here and there, but mostly freestyle. But then transition over to the event in Oakland, Lush One's first Grind Time event, uh, Grind Time West's first event, and me and Soros headlining, which would be like basically the first headlining of the best uh, (laughs) division in Grind Time. Uh, Yeah, it was definitely all written or 99% written. I threw a couple of freestyles in there, but I, I wrote most of it. I actually got arrested like a week before it, which kind of threw off my week. So it was nice that I could still get arrested in a whole different place. You know, it really kept that consistent, but it was a bullshit arrest, but it, was yeah. still, it threw off my week. Oh, hundred percent. Can't, it's not going to make your week better. I don't think. Well, they, uh, cause I spent the whole week. <laughs> I should probably shouldn't even say this right here. Spent the whole week, uh, thinking about hurting someone because they did my cuffs like really, really tight for no reason. And I lost feeling in my hands for like a week. And I thought I wasn't going to get my hands back. So I was dealing with that shit. Oh, that's yeah. tough. That's actually fun, a similar bad story. Um, one of my best friends growing up got addicted to um, uh, Oxycontin and fentanyl and everything. And uh, when he got, I forget what he got arrested for, but when he got arrested, he used to always punch his wall because he would have that to, to take the pain away. And yeah. I get, he, he went to jail. And when he was in the holding cell before they took him to the actual place, he broke his hand. And then when he was like trying to like get them to sympathize for him, they're like, you're the one that fucking broke your hand. So he went his first like three months with just a broken hand. <clears throat> well, here's what I got arrested for, which is real great. They dropped it clearly after I tell you what it was, but I got arrested for being drunk in public, walking out of a club that was closing. So the cop parks his car in front of the door, it's closing and he just starts arresting people for drunk in public, walking out as it's closing. Even worse, I live across the street. that's that's the worst i'm like get the fuck out of here and he threw me in a van this is i found out later like you know it's so funny because like i said i'm colombian but here mostly everyone's puerto rican right so here i'm puerto rican and in the west mostly everyone's mexican so there i'm mexican right so here i'm puerto rican in the west i'm mexican he locks me up they got like a whole van paddy wagon that they're just throwing people in for drunk in public which is insane to me because you're arresting people for leaving this club walking out Anyway, uh, he throws me in this van. Mind you, this is a diverse city. Every single person in this van is Mexican, and they all look like a variation of me, sort of, right? 
like my age ish, you know, same type of dude. And I'm like, this is pretty fucking coincidental that in this diverse city, no other person or culture was arrested. So when I met with a lawyer like a week later, two weeks later, uh, I found out that they had, uh, there was a class action suit against the city for targeting Spanish people. <laughs> And this, and I, and they wanted me to be a part of this suit, which I didn't, because I was like, I don't want my name on some cop list. But, mm -hmm. uh, like, it was very real what I thought while I was in the van that they were just targeting certain people, and then they dropped my case because it was just bullshit anyway. But what a hassle! That's something else. Eh? What a mm -hmm. what a what a what a fucking weird world we live in, man. Like it's <clears throat> it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, but anyway, he messed up my hand, so I threw off my. Uh, my battle mindset for a couple of weeks, <laughs> but it still is one of the, to this day, as you said, like the main event from the first event from, I would say the best division in battle rap history because of all the battle of the bays and everything. Yeah, I, I agree too. Also, let me just, this also ties to battle rap. Yeah. That arrest made me miss that scribble jam. Really? Which I, I was going to go to. Because I was looking at your catalog. 2008 Scribble Jam, which is the last one, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Which I don't think anyone knew it was the last one. And I was like, oh, I can't go now, clearly, uh, because I got all this going on. But yeah, I was ready. I knew who was going to be in it because you got a lot of WRC overflow, right? I knew like, oh, Kid Twist will be in it. And, you know, Thesaurus clearly was going to be in it. Ilmac, all these guys. So, well. Yeah, no, it's funny uh, again because... Happen. It's funny though because uh, that sucks that that happened, right? Because I was when I was looking up your catalog, I already know most of your stuff, but I was like, it's so weird to see that you did WRCs, you did a DVD that you weren't in Scribble Jam, but I guess that's why, and that's kind of that sucks, you know. Well, different mindset. This is just goes back to being, you know, not naive, just kind of hard headed and and narrow minded on some things. It was like, I I guess in the overall terms, I don't fall into like the street battler category, but I'm not like a nerd per se right so in our mind me and critical like scribble jam which is not you know looking at it again but at the moment we didn't go because we're like us like for some nerds or some shit so we just didn't go for years because it was just like nah i don't do that but so dumb obviously should have gone multiple times multiple years other dudes from here used to go red simpkins matt ills would go and they'd tell us about it johnny storm no, I think he missed his, and then someone took his spot as Johnny Blaze, which is hilarious <laughs> because it was Johnny Storm's spot, and then the name got changed, and it wasn't even Johnny Storm, which is amazing. Johnny Blaze, just another form of fire. I want to say it was Red Simpkins <laughs> who took his spot, and then they didn't even have the right name nor the right person, so it's just perfect. It That's... reminds me of when I used to sign up fake break dancers or b-boys for competitions and then just let them announce the names, and then the b-boy would never show up. Shouts to uh, Gremlin McHam Slice. He signed up for a bunch of events. <laughs> that's fucking, that's, I think that's actually like a perfect analogy to who you are. <laughs> it's just a <laughs> dude, I'll tell you when it, the, the day I realized that I did shit like that I thought was funny for no, when no one was around, I just did it for me. That's when I was like, all right, there might be a problem here. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. you know, sometimes you're trying to impress or make someone else laugh when you're just doing it for yourself. Like, you're like, uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm different. Yeah, no, it's it's so funny that you say that because like sometimes like I do a lot of things that like my girlfriend or like my friends think that like is malicious or like a dick, but like I just find it kind of comedic. Like right. I used to comment on this one guy's YouTube channel. He's like this old man who clearly like is probably divorced or never married, lives by himself in like Portland, and uh, it's called Killer Mike's <laughs> Sandwiches. Not talking oh, about the rapper, uh -huh. and yeah. he just does the most simple like a fucking fried egg sandwich or a fucking grilled cheese. And I would just comment consistently like I fucking hate you, Mike. I hate your sandwiches. Oh, your trash. And then I, so every mean. like every five videos, I'd say. Yo, that sandwich actually looked kind of good, Mike. <laughs> and he would respond every time, like, yo, that's mean. But then I'd be nice and be like, yo, that's nice. Uh, uh, he responds, I could never. <laughs> Dude, to come that's back. That's one thing I learned YouTube. early on. Don't ever respond to YouTube comments. Well, two months ago, my one of my friends from when I used to do those comments back in the day, he sends me a the Andrew Shaw's podcast, Flagrant 2. And they were talking about this guy. And I was like, well, fuck, that's, there's, there's the wave that I could have been on back in the day, there you, you know? Go, man. There you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... What was it like for you when battle rap started getting so popular with the modern uh, era? Because like you were right there, you were at like all the big events. Like you were even doing like the New Year's event in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, it's so and crazy that uh, just by pure coincidence, right? Because 
I had gotten a job in San Jose and that's why I moved out there. And it's just coincides with the launch of grind time West. Like, you know, that was in August or September, 2008 was the event. And I moved there in May. So it was right there. I just happened to be on the cusp of one of the best runs in battle rap history in the forefront. Cause if I lived here, yeah, maybe I would have gotten booked for certain events and I could have gone out, but those ones I could go to every event. I could drive to LA, right? It was a five hour drive from where I lived. Uh, I could go to Oakland, which is, you know, 35, 40 minutes, even San, uh, San Francisco, right? It's an hour drive for me. Everything is around me when it's happening, which is just perfect timing. Like it couldn't have worked out better. So for me, I'm already an outsider. I'm never like an outsider, like as in like, you know, I don't fit in, but I'm definitely not like anyone where I lived. They had never met anyone like me. I really stick out. So I think I just <laughs> was very memorable to people, hopefully in a good way, but definitely in a like, he might be crazy way. Cause I was definitely way more out of control, you know, in 2008 than I am now, which is 13 years ago or whatever. But, uh, it was awesome to be part of that, you know, just to be around and especially when I'm at the height of like partying. So I'm like, Hey, let's rap and then let's throw a party. Let's go here. Let's go there. All of these cities are, are new to me. Let's just do everything possible. So it was amazing to just be a headliner and to just uh, have not, you know, fame or, but some form of notoriety within this area that I'm taking part in this culture in also. Yeah, for sure. And another thing that I do want to speak on is, so yeah, Mattis was in the, as I said, in the grind time West and there was the LA events, there was Oakland events, San Francisco, and these were all the biggest events of that time. And then, and then um, mm -hmm. other leagues around the world started popping up uh, a la WRC's uh, Canadian league popped up an Australian league popped up a UK league popped up and then madness and dirtbag Dan uh, battle each other at an event as a fundraiser to send themselves to uh, to England to battle at Don't Flop, and that was the right. first international battle there. And so, what was that like, man? Going to London? I think and I hit all three, um, except Canada. I just I got sent back. But you battled Kid Twist. On I was I was going up there to battle Kid Twist, and this is around like when I battled Ilmax. So this is a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure no other American had like flown there to battle. I want to say I was the first, but it didn't work out clearly. But uh, I got there and, you know, which everyone's heard all the horror stories at the border. And, you know, I get there and they pull your sheet because from what I found out, especially, especially on the Toronto and Ontario side, uh, your side's FBI or whatever you guys call it is in the same office as ours. So if they want records, they just walk over and they go, hey, pull this for this person for me, which doesn't happen when you know, I've been all over the world. Like, you know, in England, they're not able to pull that, but on your border, they definitely can. And I got there and he's like, Hey, you, you ever been in trouble with the law? And I'm like, no, <laughs> he's like, he just stares at the computer screen. And he's like, all right. And he's like, he leaves and then he comes back with like this stack of papers. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> He's like, yeah, it seems like you've been untruthful with us. I'll never fucking forget this dude because I saw him again uh, when I went. But uh, yeah, I got, uh, got sent back on that one. So that didn't happen. But England did happen. Me and Dirtbag Dan, first Americans there. I battled Kulez. I don't even know why I wanted to battle Kulez. Wasn't he in the WRCs? And he, he was in the WRCs, he, yeah. As, um, as they said in England, he chatted a lot of shit. Oh, he chatted mad shit. Um, I also have family in England, which uh, is crazy. Um, so my cousins I hadn't seen and my aunt over there. So I'm like, this is a good opportunity to like mix in seeing family that I haven't seen in a while out there. Shouts to my cousin, close up things. He's, he's a dope artist too. Oh, cool. But um, I, I kind of modeled my early grind time career, quote unquote, around dudes that I never got the opportunity to battle in WRCs. So it's like Marv One, 360, like cool as like uh Kid Twist, all these guys like that I obviously love. Ilmac is another one 
obviously loved it. I was just like, I would love to battle these dudes. I kind of wasn't around that competition in Florida. Like I had already battled everyone that was available here. And, you know, early days, you drive everywhere to battle anyway, but it wasn't like that. So going out there, it's so funny too, because I look back and Dan and O'Shea is such an amazing battle. And I always look back and I'm like, why didn't I just battle O'Shea? <laughs> like it would have been great, but it just, I couldn't take away because theirs was amazing. I just absolutely murderized Kulez, who was not prepared. I think he freestyled a lot of it. And that was that. But that was an amazing event. Charlie Sloth was there, if you know who that is. Of course. Charlie Sloth. Shows to Camden. Uh, yeah. Um, There's a lot of people there. It was for the first Don't Flop event. It was packed. And that was a very receptive crowd, which Oakland, London, and maybe like Melbourne, Australia, probably my top three like crowds, like just – the crowds, they get so into it. It just amps you up. It's almost like you're a sports legend or something. And I'm out here just out of shape, loving it. Well, I want to actually talk about that because you actually have quite a few battles in Australia. I do. And so what's your, like, did you, did you gain good connections with the folks out there that ran the events and they loved you so much because of the reaction or what was your relationship with Australia? Because you're uniquely like one of the guys who battled there quite a bit. Yeah. I think I've been there like four times, maybe. Mm hmm um and i battled twice at two events so i have a lot of battles yeah you're right uh yeah i think it's just maybe like my style just works over there and they like it that much and i was kind of one of those grind time dudes that uh was more on the funnier side which a lot of their battlers were leaning that way in the earlier days just like a lot of places and you know, I had become friends with dudes through WRC's like Anecdote and 360. I had to always talk to. Um, 360 obviously goes on to be a massive artist. But uh, yeah, I think that's really it, man, because the first event was Got Beef, and me, Soros, and Dan were the three going over there. Actually, Soros was going with us to London too, and he got sent back. Yes, I do remember hearing about that. Yeah, that's uh, he was on uh, supposed to go with us to London. I think he was even on our flight too. And he uh, can he you tell me? Prison. Can you tell me who he was supposed to battle? Do you remember that? <sighs> I want to say like archaic, maybe or something like archaic that. Archaic or like truth, maybe somewhere in there. Archaic or truth, some one of those, or maybe both of them. Yeah, damn. I'm trying. I really have to rack my brain for that. But yeah, he definitely got sent back. I think he told them, I'm here to battle rap. And they were like, all right, get him out of here. <laughs> That's the worst. Like flying that far and then just having to turn around and come back. Like I did fly pretty far to Toronto because like from Florida, it would have been like a three hour flight or two and a half hours. But from the West coast, I flew out of San Francisco. It was probably like seven hours and to have to go through all of that. And then to just to have like an armed guard walk you back onto a plane immediately. It's like, ugh. Then they flew me to New Jersey and I had to sleep there all night. And then I flew back to San Francisco. They're trying to send me to LA because people who aren't from California or know anything about California, I think LA and San Francisco are like the only places, but <laughs> they're six, six and a half hours away from each other or six hours away from each other. But anyway, yeah, Australia was just, I guess just good connections. Yeah. Cause um, decoy had reached out to us and was like, Hey, I'm looking to put in a, an event together we want to bring back justice and him and Soros battle, but we kind of want to do it two on two. So it's not just a rehash of their uh, scribble jam battle. And I'm like, okay, in retrospect, I battled anecdote also in retrospect, I took the anecdote battle way more serious than the two on two, not knowing what it would be, you know? And uh, I, I leaned on Soros more than anything because I was like, Hey, I got this one-on-one -on -one that I should probably really kill because it's just me. Whereas this one, I've got you to kind of lean on. But that battle, man, that battle is humongous. That battle, I think so many Australians know me from that battle. And I'm just like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm it's, just, I'm it's just a there. sick battle. It's so, but you still did great. I can't, I haven't watched it in a long time. But did you, did you guys do like the last round of the battle outside or was the whole battle? We did. Outside? The venue closed. And yes. I don't even think it was that late, but it was just one of those deals, I think, where the venue just wasn't doing what they wanted or something and they just kicked everybody out so we went in the alley right on the side of the venue uh, i met dudes 
from Australia in Israel who were like talking to me about battle rap. And I was like, yeah, I battled out there. And they're like, wait a second. Like you would be in the 360 battle. I'm like, yeah, that's me, man. That's wild, man. Yeah. It's that, that battle really had some reach, which is uh, again, just, I always take the wrong ones more serious than the other ones. <laughs> that's the story of my life, man. Just always taking the wrong things serious. Well, actually just cause I want to, uh, because you said that, what's the weirdest recognition or in, like the weirdest place you've been recognized? Or just like the most surprising? You're just like, I didn't know that that would happen here. I definitely caught a few while I was pissing. Like that's happened more than once. <laughs> I have. So just to go back on, yeah, my friends are ruthless, right? Nonstop jokes, nonstop shit talking, always, all of us, forever, our whole lives. And uh, this one, I took a trip with my like, all of my friends had witnessed somebody like recognizing me as madness at some point, which I don't care on that level, but it's just funny to see their reactions. Cause they don't give a shit. I'm always going to be Tony to them. Like they're never, you know, I'm never going to matter <laughs> in that sense. But uh, one of them, shout outs, D Nick, uh, his, his like, he, you always had that one friend who's always got your number, no matter how good your joke is, like they'll shut you down, like no matter what. And he's mine. So he had never seen anyone come up to me or whatever. We were in Buffalo. Shouts to Buffalo. Shouts to Griselda. This is before all that, but we, uh, they're from Buffalo. And we were there just partying for like a couple of days. And this is, I don't know, this is a decade ago or something. But uh, I'm in the bathroom in our, our washroom, whatever you guys want to call it. But I'm in the bathroom and I'm at the urinal. He's at the urinal next to me. I'm like pissing and I turn and this guy looks at me while he's like in like waiting in the line to piss and he goes fucking grind time madness <laughs> and I could just see Dennis like the silhouette next to me he leans back and he goes are you fucking kidding me <laughs> I'm like man this is the couldn't be more perfect dude could have been perfect like that was just great that but like multiple times pissing it has happened I don't know why I'm so recognizable at the urinal but it happens <laughs> I had one, a dude with, I was eating dinner with my mom somewhere and he wanted to take a picture in the middle of the restaurant. I'm like, dude, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not an actual celebrity out here. <laughs> That's what was like a big realization for me as a teenager. When I went to my, like once I became of age and I went to my first battle rap event, I was like, Oh, they're just fucking regular people. And some of them are kind of like losers actually. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of losers in battle rap because it's the it's you the know, it's the ego it's the egotistical ones who don't aren't just good people. Like I remember meeting I don't want to say his name, but he like he's hated throughout battle rap. But I remember meeting him and like he just thought it, he was standing in the middle of this club and he was just like looking for people to recognize him. And I was like, I'm not going to say hi to this guy. Oh man, that's not cool. Because like, you know, I probably know him. <laughs> oh, you do, you do. We'll just say that. Um, okay, here we go. We're not going to say his name. I don't want him to be on. Let's just say Caustic may or may not have written for him in the past. Oh yeah, I definitely know him. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> See, but I always have a different experience meeting people, right? Because I meet them as a peer. Exactly. As to, you know, uh, as a fan, which I've met rappers that I love as a fan, but I still don't even act like that anyway. But uh, um, there's dip, there there is though there's a certain mindset of in battle rap, right? There's a lot of us that come from like a hip hop background, right? I grew up listening to hip hop. I love. I made music way before battle rap. Um, I still make music, you know, that, that's going to be my first love before battle rap. I do love battling, but it's very one dimensional, right? You're just disrespecting another person and kind of flexing a little bit of rap skill here and there, but writing songs is completely different. Mm -hmm. But there are a certain sect of people that like battle rap and are in battle rap because they like the disrespect part of it. And it's, or they just like, I hate to even compare it to like right wing dudes like that love battle rap only because you can say something to someone's face that's offensive and get away with it. Right. Cause they think that that's how things should be. And I was never part of that world. Like I used to say offensive things, I guess, but there's always, you know, a little bit of humor to it. It was never serious, but that's a good point though. It reminds the what you say, the right wing dudes, it kind of reminds me of people who are fan. I'm not a big fighter fan, but yeah. there's that Trump supporter UFC guy who apparently like gets a lot of media because he's super fucking racist and controversial and shit like oh, that. Yeah. But there's um, definitely that mindset. And there is, there's definitely a few battle rappers who have those kind of fans too. They like them because it's strictly about what they're saying. And they're like, yeah, that's how you say it. Instead of just it being an art form, it's more of a like, 
breaking the laws of being offensive and shit like that, which is so corny. <laughs> Have you heard of that fucking my like the per like if I see somebody share this guy's music, I delete them right away. Tom McDonald. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't okay. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so I should have even fucking said this. Yeah, that. and his fans are the epitome of these people. The worst people in the world, man. And you can look just uh, if you looked at probably all his comments at a picture of him back to back, they're all wearing the same sunglasses, the same shirt, like like the same guy and they've never listened to rap before but this is the greatest rapper that ever lived oh dude don't uh, fucking hate it um sorry for you i mentioning them uh, let's speak about your music well, let's compare it to something else it's like when you meet a girl who's like this place has the best tacos you've ever had and it's the only taco place they've ever been to it's like you don't know <laughs> shit about anything it's like uh, in the small towns i grew up in the one chinese spot it's like bro this sweet and sour chicken is so authentic yeah that's what i'm saying it's like <laughs> You don't know anything else, so you have like, no comparison level. They look at you weird when you order like uh, shumai or like some like lotus leaf rice, and they're they're like, "That's uh, not a spring roll. What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not ordering the. Uh, <laughs> All right, you know, like you're not getting white boyed like by the orders. You're like sweet and sour chicken or whatever the like uh, top of, uh, ordered thing is by people who aren't from the culture. Oh, I fucking hate it, man. <laughs> I I actually um I'm a I professionally um a cook and i one of my favorite restaurants oh, i've worked at was a cambodian and a laotian restaurant which is very nice. fucking cool yeah, um we I, got that here we got pretty much everything here this that's one thing that i'm very been very beneficial to have is the being from an extremely diverse city i think this is the most diverse place in the country i mean i've been to other places like maybe new york city but i don't even feel like it's like here because everyone here is just so different like i went to school with every culture i've been that we have every restaurant from every culture you can name like it's just you know it's wild that what sucks up here is we get everything after it's trending because everything now is like on like an instagram or stunt food right so like yeah like out now every chicken sandwich is a nashville chicken sandwich every fucking taco is a berea taco and none of them actually do it well which is the problem you know like that's what sucks about up here like is just like oh fuck Anyway, I've been to uh, I don't think I've been to Ottawa. I know you guys got the Baton Rouge there. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> you know who I used to get my food suggestions from when I moved here? Rest in peace, Bender. He used to give oh, me the yeah. best food suggestions. Oh, man, it, I used to talk to Bender about movies all the time or TV shows. We'd always run theories back and forth. And like, that was my guy. We'd be like, yo, who you think did it? Like, I remember The Leftovers when it was running on HBO. We'd have all these theories and it was so, this is strictly a deep cut for like Leftovers fans who watch that show. But I remember he told me uh, his homegirl or, or him and her had this theory. Have you ever seen that show, by the way? No, I haven't. I should okay. watch it though. People just disappear, like tons yeah. of people. Okay. And he was just telling me, uh, yeah, we think uh, they were all wished away. And I'm like, damn, that's, cr that's a crazy theory. That's, it never became that, but... I was, I always remembered like having that conversation with them about that show because I was like, that theory is, I think, better than what happened on that show. That's wild. Well, here's one for you that I always say, because, okay, a lot of people hate it or love it. Lost, I still love Lost. I don't know what your opinion is on it, but this is my theory, right? There, I have a few theories, but one of my main theories is that it lost. Uh, if people haven't watched it, it's people who are on an island, people think they no, died, I, but they're I, not dead. I, just for listeners. Um, yeah. So my theory is it's purgatory. Like yeah. the island is purgatory and it's like that difference between like hell and heaven and like the good and the bad. But then there's, but then when the whole John Locke turned into the black smoke kind of fucks it up. What's you, do you have any theories of, on that? I never finished lost, man. I'm going to catch some hate for that, but, uh, well, it's kind of a good, it's what, uh, people, I just started game of Thrones two years ago and people tell me to just not watch the last season. They're like, just watch up until the seventh season. Yeah. It's kind of one of those deals where it, it it's, it's not bad. It just feels rushed. And I'm trying to hold on. I'm looking up something here because I can't remember this guy's name. Um, what the hell? Is... <laughs> hold on one second. Can I help? Uh, What's what, what? 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 No, the writer of Lost. Why can't I remember his name? Was he it JJ JJ wrote... Abrams or was he? No, JJ Abrams uh, was the he... showrunner and the creator, mm -hmm. but uh, the writer. He also wrote Watchmen and like uh, Prometheus and everything. I, I can't think of his name. I think what happened was the writers left like four seasons in. So I think there was new writers and that's why the uh, show. Damon Lindelof. There we go. Bam. Damon Lindelof. I am a big fan of his writing. I don't know why I couldn't think of his name right now. There's just so many thoughts going through here, but um, he's very cliffhangery, I guess, as a writer. Yes. Um, but he wrote Watchmen, the series, which I thought was incredible. 
uh, on HBO also, which shout outs to HBO, the greatest network that ever lived. If I was ever going to fanboy on anything, it's HBO, HBO and sandwiches. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have a theory about Lost because I never finished it. I watched three seasons. How many did it go? Six, seven? Six, six. <laughs> yeah. So I never, ever. Tony. Got there. Uh, this is <laughs> people are only listening. Is that the wire? Yeah, it is. Box set, baby. I got it right over here. That's uh, on my shelf. All my movies are right behind me. So, okay. Yeah, I got the same one over there. I got the Sopranos whole set there somewhere. What else do I got? I got fucking everything. It's the best, man. HBO is the best. It really is, man. It really is. I think the Sopranos is probably still the greatest series of all time. Um, the wire in a close second. I really do think Game of Thrones was about to take the top spot because the writing, I actually restarted it again yesterday, coincidentally, oddly enough, yeah. But uh, it's insane. I know it all, I came from book material, so you have a lot to work with already, but it is insane how, there's no spoilers, but every single person's arc and storyline connects to a plot point that matters and has a payoff every time, except at the end. But uh, up until like when people think that it went bad, like the way everyone is connected in the story, and there's like 30 main characters, all of them in the writing, it, it, it blows my mind. That is such good writing. Like the plots are incredible. Every subplot matters. There's never a throwaway moment. It always ties back. There's the callbacks to everything in that show. 100% bro. And um, it's so I, I said, I'm a professional cook, because you got to pay bills, but I did go to school for script writing. So I love writing, right. And so what I found so cool, when I first started Game of Thrones being so late in the game was yeah. Ned Stark, I'm like, this guy's the fucking man, he's going to be the main character, he's going to be the the like, that is going to be the show. And then it's like this, like six episodes in or something, he gets killed. But like, yeah, that just goes to show it, and it and it was amazing how it because then it brought all these other characters to be right. things that you didn't think they would be it's yeah. wild man it's wild I, I don't think anyone had seen that before where they build up a main character and then they just die in the first season you're you're thinking what the hell but you're right then they set up all these other people like it's so funny too because i didn't read the books but you know i kind of researched a little bit of them but i didn't i didn't spoil anything for myself but in the was it the fourth or the fifth season when john snow gets stabbed up by his other members of the watch that season you really start caring for Jon Snow like he kind of was like a side character early on because he's the younger brother and whatnot and he's there like he has good you know a good arc it's starting but that season you're really like man I'm, I think I'm really starting to like Jon Snow like this guy he's, he's great and then boom that happens so they really built up every character's importance at the right time Quite such a crazy show, man. Because I guess for me, it's cool. Because as I said, I'm just like, well, like I'm watching it now, you know. And it's like, uh, it's just wild to see. Like as you talk about characters, like Arya Stark is insane. What you see at the beginning, like she like hits that rich kid with like a wooden stick, and then she becomes like a crazy assassin. Or right, and that's the reason her dad dies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. And then, or also the brother who's uh, paralyzed, who can like be the wolf, uh, the yeah. dire wolf. Like it's insane. Man. Like this, the the story arcs and everything, man. Like my favorite character is probably Tyrion. I loved when he was the watch, him and his friend. I forget the guy's name who was his champion who, who saved him from being. Oh, Bron. Yes. Name, right? Bron? Yeah. yeah, just a badass. <laughs> I will say that, you know, I think like everyone else, I really got into like just reading online theories toward the end because you're just like, all right, it's ending soon. Let's see what the people think based on because the books were over. So now it's just strictly in theory world. And I will say, man, some of the online theories were far better than how it did end but maybe I a lot of openings left in certain things. And I feel like uh, they could have utilized certain characters better, but obviously I don't do a show on that high level and shout outs to them because they are far more successful than me. And who knows if I could even do what they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so some things too. Like, I don't know if you were ever watched this, but a show that I kind of thought would have been amazing that only did one season was, um, vinyl oh love watch? vinyl i just I love that. it again a couple months ago yeah i will tell you what i thought was wrong with that show um but after watching it again it's that richie finestra is extremely unlikable no matter what okay and i, I love 
they ended Boardwalk Empire to create vinyl. So Boardwalk oh, that's Empire wild. one more season. Did you watch Boardwalk Empire? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so from the fourth to the fifth season, they just skipped over everyone's most famous historical pieces, like the rise of Al Capone, the death of Rothstein, like all these things. And they just jumped ahead in time. And then, you know, it ends in a shortened season, which was still a good season. But uh, Terrence Winter or Terry Winter, he ended it early because I guess they offered him to do vinyl with Scorsese, you know, and they're huge music heads, both of them. Um, and then I, I loved vinyl. I thought it was great. But I think on a grander scale, like I said, there is no redeeming qualities about that dude, man. Yeah. The only thing that what I loved about it is being like such a, like for me, like, as you said, like with battle rap, I'm so in depth I, I, with, with basketball, I love stats and yeah. I love like, so hip hop, nobody ever talks about the DJ cool Herc, like uh, in the Bronx, like with the light post and the music yep. and like that scene in that show was crazy to me. I'm like, yo, I oh, love that. Man. They're finally really shining think, light on that. You know, I think they were trying to go that direction too, which I is think a bummer. Really, like they're in the, the rise of punk, which coincided with hip hop in New York city, which that's where they are in the show. And I really think that that's the direction. Like if they had a second season that, it would split its time between, uh, you know, punk and hip hop in New York, and which would have been amazing. But yeah, they renewed. What a cast too! I know, dude. It was insane. It was insane. Uh, this is uh, this is great. Like I love that we went off on this tent. I want to do. I want to ask you your opinion on one more show that just has come into my mind that I think uh -huh. is like news radio. I fucking loved news radio. Did you like news radio at all? I it's I watched some of it, but. It's, I never kept up like anything okay. that went over like 10 episodes. I just Yeah. Couldn't. Well, how about uh, if we're speaking? Cause like, as you said, like, do you know boardwalk empire? I'm thinking in my head, like I watched everything with Michael K. Williams after the wire. Did you oh, like, yeah. did you like Treme? I loved Treme. Love Treme also. And Which Anthony Bourdain did, writing on it was right. great too. Yeah. I really liked the twist in season one where it was like, you thought it was in modern times, but it was really during Katrina. Yes. Cool. And I love new Orleans, man. I go there a bunch. Well, not now, but no one's traveling anywhere. But uh, well, I did go there a bunch, and my wife loves New Orleans, so she knows everywhere to go in New Orleans. So it's just uh, a good tie-in. She's a huge jazz enthusiast, too. So um, what a good show. And I really, really, really liked The Deuce also, which was his kind of return to the Wire-esque storylines mixed in with, you know, everything else that was going on, their little porn and drug industries and whatnot. But... They did have yeah. some mobsters in that show, which was nice. And he interviewed Snoop too. Like for, that was a cool, different introspective from The Wire when he entered, when he ended up interviewing Snoop later in life. It's, That's right. it's so crazy. It's so funny, man. My mom's like this uh, elementary school principal, uh, book club, mindfulness meditation, Buddhist walks fucking 20 miles a day. Uh, she, I watched The Wire with her and it was so funny because you know, it's a gang, but like The Wire is so universal. She loved it. And the funny thing was her two favorite characters were Bubbles and Omar, like two complete, but she's like all the, they both show so much love, Sam. That's what I'm trying to say is they show so much love. You talk about more good writing, man. The arc on those people too is like everyone gets their redemption or, you know, they just, they fall off. But the, how the kids' futures parallel the adults' endings also, like how Michael becomes the new Omar and like Dookie becomes like the new Bubbles and Sid Nor becomes like the new maybe Lester Freeman slash McNulty. Like it's really crazy. Like the 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 circular uh, arc of all these people. How like someone takes their place and how the world just keeps moving that way. Like yeah, you once your story ends, someone just picks up where you left off. It's so true, man. And it, it's like it's crazy. Like the stories in that show. Like the the characters and the. I yeah, just rewatched all of that too, man. I'm, I do I it once a year. I'm not leaving the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I'm I showed everything. I was trying to show my girl. She didn't get into it, but what she did, what she did do, which was funny to me, she's like, "That looks like a young Michael B. Jordan." I'm like, "That's because it is." And she's like, "That it looks is. like a young Idris Elba." I'm like, "It is. That's a young. That's like." That's and, another thing too. When you're you know, watching it, you're like, "Wow!" Like almost everyone on this show became really famous. Even Lance Reddick, uh, who was you know their boss, like he's in a ton of stuff after that too. Um, but Bro, the mayor is in Peaky Blinders. And he's in Game of Thrones also. He's in, they're in everything. Or like, even Ethan Gillen. I really, I could oh, name actors all day. What about McNulty's uh, character? Name me his, uh, his acting name. Uh, Dominic uh, West. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was, he was in like a, a UK small series show recently in the last few years. I can't remember the name of it, but it was I don't good. Know, he's too. in The Affair, which is another one on Showtime. Yeah. Luther which with Idris like, Elba was good. Really show that I found out. While I was there, they're like, yeah, we like the Israeli version better. I'm like, what? 
I will say Idris Elba fooled me, but McNulty did not. But Idris Elba fooled me at least for the three seasons that he was on. Yep. And he was not American. He got I didn't it. know that. Nobody and the guy seen from, him before, really. That and the guy from Homeland. The guy from Homeland tricked me. I don't know about you, but. Uh, oh, I already knew him too. He had a really uh, good show called Life, like which was. something too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <clears throat> but no, yeah, it's so funny that always the, the people who aren't from America and Canada are the better actors than the people that are from. <laughs> but. <laughs> i.e. everybody in the world mel gibson i always wonder like clearly they're amazing actors but i always wonder if there's like some tax break sometimes because <laughs> there will be an entire show that is based on a specific sect of being an american and no one's american yeah it's wild yeah like, or like, like i'll give you a perfect example recently mayor of east town yep she's british uh her daughter's australian uh guy pierce is australian like it's just like all, all amazing actors without a doubt, but it's just like, I wonder how you come to that, you know, when it's like, Hey, this accent is very American. Like this is a very small town in America. Like I know you're looking for the best actors clearly, but I just, I always wonder how you end up with a bunch of non-Americans because on, on the other end, there are a lot of Americans who do British movies and accents and whatever. Some of them are very bad at it, but Everyone else is better at doing our accent than we are at theirs. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, even like look at the Avengers. Like more than half of the main characters are British, even though like some of them are actually like they don't change their accent, but still like it's like the biggest franchise out, right? Yeah, um, right. Yeah. No. Fuck. What a great conversation about all that shit. I wanted to before we we're going on, but um, I want you to talk about Delicatessen, your project quickly oh, because yeah. we haven't spoken about your music a lot, and I just want to, people to speak about to hear about it. <clears throat> Well, as you know, I come from a group, Critical Madness, so we put out a bunch of albums, right? But we were also, uh, we met battling, which is funny, through freestyle battling, but uh, we were both solo artists, right? He's critical on Madness, it's pretty easy. Um, so we always made Critical Madness music, but we always made Critical and Madness music, right? So I was uh, living in California, which I met, you know, Skylar G and Dirtbag Dan and Abel and all them for Counterproductive. And I knew a lot of producers out there as well, but I was always hanging with Skylar because I would be over at their house when they'd be recording and things like that. They had a nice studio, like a whole garage turned into a studio. And Skylar would always just play me beats and I thought his style was really good. And it really matched the way that I rap. Like it was kind of bouncy in a, in a beat nuts-esque way, right? It has like bouncy samples and things of that nature. And which is how I came across the classy beat. But uh Delicatessen was, he had sent me a bunch of beats over time and I just had written to them and I just, I banged that whole, it's actually 14 songs, but I banged out that whole album in like a day and a half. And I decided I was going to just put out seven of them for now, just like pick seven bangers, but kind of diverse, right? There's like a life song on there, you know, there's a bunch of hardcore songs. So that's just my forte anyway. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to put something out since I hadn't put out some solo music in a long time. So I was like, let's just get this out here. I got some other things on the horizon. Let me throw my name back out in the mix. Plus it's like, why am I just sitting on this music anyway? Like get this shit out there. There's gonna be like at least two people that like it. It's like uh, Johnny Storm has been releasing like a song a day. He was telling me, he's like, he's like, man, like this stuff is from like 10 years ago. I just needed to put it out, you know? You know what though? I, I will say about like music that's old. If nobody's heard it, it's not old, it's new. 100% because you could um, you can listen to like a, a record that you haven't listened to before and it could be new or it could be 20 years old but at the end of the day it's new you know that's absolutely right man there's there'll be like some of my favorite rappers they'll put out like an unreleased album and I'm like well this is brand new to me or like Nas Lost Tapes you're just like yeah I don't care if you recorded this during I Am like this is still a banger yeah yeah well and like um uh damn i just completely had a train of thought that i let that lost me but it's all good we'll just go on. i was gonna tell you, reference a fucking rapper but whatever i can't even think of what i was gonna reference um yeah, but that's just you know me putting out something because it's been a while I st i'm still sitting on a bunch of music that i'm about to put out just because i want to shoot some videos but clearly last year put a stop to a lot of that yeah so i was planning i got a few planned that are pretty wild idea videos so I'm going to get those out. I got a club song coming out. <laughs> there we go. There we go. My man Dixie over in Melbourne, Australia, actually, who I know from over there. Also, uh, we did a song. Um, it's about, 
how can I say this in a nice way? Breasts. Uh, <laughs> it's a club song. It's called Tits. And uh, <laughs> just, I mean, this is a straight up club song. I also have an EP uh, that I did as a little group called Loner, L-O-N-R, uh, with my mans. Uh, and it's borderline like new wave mixed with rap. So okay. It's, it's been fucking around making some different kind of music because, you know, why not? Oh yeah, man! I had um, my heart out forever. Like, let's try some other things. It's no, I mix it. It's good to mix it up. I had Cheddar Cheese on last week, and he like started off doing parody music. Now he's making like club bangers, and he, you Dude, know, he his went music from, is so good. It's so good. And I, we made a joke because he used to be a strip club DJ. He's like, now they play my music in the strip club. There you go. That's, not, <laughs> that's man. You want to talk about full circle? There it is. There you go. <laughs> he should get to announce his own songs when they come on. That would be fire, man. That would be fire. <laughs> so um, you're actually returning to battle rap, I think, for the first time since 2017, I want to say. I don't know. It's been for It's been long enough that I don't remember. <laughs> when you battled Kid Twist at the premiere for Body to, in the yeah, Toronto International Film Festival. One. I did do one in England. Oh, you did right after, event, I think. Yeah. But uh, that wasn't a battle. It was more of uh, concept, conceptual rapping. Me and Bamalam did one in okay. London. I want to say okay. like two years ago. But as far as writing full-on, one-on-one actual opponent battle, yeah, it's been a while. I would say Kid Twist and me in Toronto for the body premiere, which, I mean, if I ended there, that would have bookmarked perfectly because you can't beat that. Like a battle at a movie premiere that you're in, you know, you got a small role in, and you got a song all over the soundtrack. Like, and awesome. you're battling the guy that, like, you, you have wrote all it. this history with. And the, the, yeah. The guy wrote it in a rematch. Yeah. It's wild. It's such, yeah, it's, it's such a mind blowing thing. That's why bodied was so awesome to me, man. I was watching with my girlfriend. I'm like, that's madness. Or I'm like, okay, that's Pat stay. I'm like, that's loaded. And then she's like, who are any of these people? <laughs> right. I'm like, they're big to me, that man. Was, uh, I had done that power Rangers short with Joseph Kahn before. Yes. That. I wanted to speak. About that that would, I would say that was my first real, I'd done short films, you know, but like local stuff, not, not big sets or anything with real money behind it. But that the Power Rangers one was my first time being on an official set, right? He, I had been talking to Joseph Kahn since he did Detention, which was years right before that. And, uh, you know, he was a battle fan. And, uh, you know, even like, <laughs> even my battle like A class, he's like, all oh, those Asian jokes are hilarious. I'm like, all right, cool. But uh, since Detention, he had told me like way back then, he said, hey man, he's like, uh, I really want to put you in something. And uh, he's like, you look too old to be a high school student, you know, for detention or whatever. And he's like, so the next time I do something, I'm going to try to get you in it. And I'm like, you know, you just cordial. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. No doubt. But you don't ever really expect anything from anyone, right? Because, you know, I'm just not that kind of person. But years later, it hits me up. Yo, I got this thing. I'm going to send you the script. It's top secret. Would you be interested? And he sends it to me and I'm reading it. And I'm like, Power Rangers? And it's like gritty right off the bat. And I'm reading it. I'm like, oh my God, this is insane. I'm like, yes. I probably said yes before I even read it. But uh, anyway, that was fantastic. I'll never forget. He asked me what kind of soda I like. I said, Diet Dr. Pepper. I got to set. They had Diet Dr. Pepper for me. Damn. We filmed it on this ranch. I'm sure this ranch has been used in so many movies because they had a fake city in this ranch that I've seen in movies and TV before. They had half airplanes, you know, that you could film inside an airplane. Oh, it was so dope. But uh, I was a little nervous, not nervous like that you could tell, but uh, I had never done this before, right? So you don't know how to navigate properly within that environment. Like I know how to be a rapper at a rap event without a doubt. I know how to move and who to talk to and who not to talk to, et cetera. But out here, like he really, you know, helped me and made me feel comfortable, but now bodied on the other hand, this is a real, real movie set. And we filmed ours in like this underground club thing, looking thing. It was like in the basement of like this big building. And uh, it did not feel like a movie set because you get there and it's just you and like 10 other battle rappers that you already know. So that really made it easy for my first time being on an actual set. Uh, because I'm just there, it's me, conceited, Roan, Kid Twist is there because he's, you know, uh, helping Joseph. There's Pat Stay, uh, Lux, Hollow. Uh, I think out of everyone there, disaster's there. Out of everyone there, the only one I hadn't ever met was like Loaded Lux, but everyone else I already knew for years. 
So that was amazing. I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but shouts to whoever I missed. But uh, that was just an incredible experience. Did not feel like a movie set. And I think that made it easy on all of us. Yeah, it's such a, it was so good too. But it's funny you say like, uh, I guess you didn't feel like it because you're close to everybody, but the production on the Power Rangers uh, short was so amazing to me. Like it, it looked like, you know, like a Transformers esque or like one of the great CGI. Like, and also, I just want to ask you, like, you, I know it's unreal to you, but that, like, what was it like to you? Because you're a huge movie buff. You're, you're like Joseph Kahn, obviously. And then I'm sure you're a big Power Rangers fan too, probably because you grew up oh, in that yeah, era, right? I mean, I aged out of Power Rangers while it was still going on, but I still watched it when I was younger, you know? Yeah. So like, is so that one I of knew those? I everything about it. I loved it. Is it like one of those things like that's a check in my, in my book that like, I'm never going to forget? Oh, everything about that was cool. That's probably the coolest thing I've ever done is mm-hmm. that. Um, it just was unlike anything else bodied is obviously very cool and very near to my heart because it's based around the subculture that I've been a part of my whole life you know but that power ranger thing was so different and it was the first time I'm doing anything like that uh, that it just was uh, just a pure moment in history and in my history that I will always hold on to because I don't know man you just watch it and I got to see it in a theater setting so that was even cooler and yeah. I got to see it in the theater setting by coincidence also because I was flying to Australia to battle and I was leaving to Australia maybe two days after they were going to do the LA premiere of that movie. So I just flew to LA because that's that you have to stop in LA to fly to Australia anyway. And I went to the movie premiere and I, I, mean, I knew Katie Sackhoff was already and I got to shoot my scenes with her. So that was awesome. But uh, yeah, everything about it was just incredible. So cool, man. It's like, to me, it's so awesome. Like how battle rap is like a vault, like, you know, it became like Joseph Kahn gets organic to be in detention and then dumbfounded. And then all, just the right. whole thing came bodied is like <clears throat> so cool. Oh, dumbfounded. That's what I missed. <laughs> there you go. Also yeah. there. And I've also known dumbfounded forever. Forever. Because you guys, uh, Dumbfounded was in the the early days of Grand Time. Dumbfounded is one of my favorite battle rappers of all time, even though he hasn't done it for years. Rest in peace to PH, who you battled like. Oh yeah, versus PH peace. is one of my favorite. You're Pumpkin still. He's, one of my favorites. I met Pumpkinhead for the first time when I was like 19. That's why I battled uh, who who is now known as Nino Bless, but I battled him back then. That's insane! What a. Yeah. And and also um earlier I said I I messed up the timeline with Iron Solomon because. Wasn't well, you said AM Boogie? Didn't he actually like battle Immortal Technique under that name? Oh, yeah, I meant to add that little tidbit. Um, he was just coming off of that maybe like a couple of days before I battled him. Okay, and that's so that was at an EO dub event, right? Like an end of the I would, I yeah, I'm gonna say it was EO dub, um, uh, or you know, somewhere where that realm of people would be because I know like Poison Pen was there. My homegirl, Lelena, shouts to Lelena, she was the manager of Fat Beats, so she was the one who like told me all about him because I had no clue, right. So she was like, hey, he, he just battled a mortal technique. You know, he's crazy. Watch out for him. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let me go out here and just get bodied by him. Thanks. Did she give you any dirt on Soulcon for your battle? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> nah, Man, I, I was he's never that type of battler, though. <laughs> got- I, I was never like, yo, let me tell you weird f- yeah. personal shit about you. Like, I always thought that shit was corny. Yo, you like, got herpes from this girl, except for when yeah. you would, no, except for when you encourage Caustic to do the Jefferson Price thing. I have uh, a Caustic. Well, I didn't encourage. Well. <laughs> you said, "Hey, man, he'd do the same shit to you." Okay, that's yes. a Caustic. I didn't I, help him write it or anything. No, no, no. He already wrote it. He already wrote it. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like you know anyone was cheating, but <laughs> he said this is the night before we we were shared a hotel room in London. He was, I think he was saying like, I don't know, dude approached him. I don't know Jefferson Price, you know, and it's, I don't do these type of battles either, right? What Caustic does, that's not my style. But he was saying, oh, dude came up to me and he's like, hey man, I heard because somebody told him what Caustic was going to say. He's like, I heard you're going to do this, this and that. So Caustic's telling me, hey man, I think I'm going to have to change my whole third by tomorrow. And in my mind, I'm like, you wrote it and it's tomorrow. Like you're going to blow it if you try to change everything. So I said, fuck them. You don't know. Them. <laughs> I was like, just do it. And I guess uh, that became a little infamous. 
part of my history too, I guess. Oh, don't worry. Caustic was ending careers before he went to England. The, yeah, the, I the still guy... stayed though because I thought it might get out of hand. Oh, okay. That's okay. I get you. So, and it did, but I missed it. So funny. So I stood on stage for nothing. Well, thank God you weren't there when Soul was there because I'm sure Soul would have knocked you out too. I'm just kidding. Oh, well, I'm just we almost, joking. <laughs> we, no, no, no. We almost fought. Did but you and Soul? Because like, you would have killed him. This kid is like, Soul is like the size of my cat. Oh, man. I saw it in his eyes. He was definitely down. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, you know, when somebody's like about it and they're not. And he was ready. But I What's... left the stage, which I, I have no beef with Soul. Clearly, I just knew something happened because mm -hmm. during the battle, I'm he, you know, they're battling, whatever. I'm watching the body language down there, and Soul's in the front, and the whole time Caustic is doing his, his, that round, Soul's like this, like shaking his head, like mad. And I'm like, all right, this might be something, you know. I think maybe at a certain point in the battle, I put my beard down, you could see. Then I'm like, just prepare, just in case. And battle ends, nothing happens. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Let me go get another drink. <laughs> As soon as I go get another drink, all I hear is, oh, and I knew immediately what happened. So I run out. I see him cutting through the crowd. I cut this way because that's where he's going. I go. Somebody grabs me. He turns around at me. He's like, what's up? And I'm like, oh, shit, it's going down. And then they break it up. That's why. Yeah. And I, I wasn't trying to get Madison involved in any in any messy shit. I shout to Soul, no, too. Soul's one of the but like, it's just the only weird thing to me is like, you know, it's controversial and I don't want to bring any controversy, but it's just weird that he would like, it's great as a friend you defend him, but I don't know if I could defend my homie if he was cheating on his, his fiance. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't know if I could. Well, I wasn't defending Jefferson Price. Are oh, you talking about soul? Soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, like, I think, man, it's, I don't know. Who knows if any of that is true. I don't know if that's true. I was just like, you wrote it. Just say it. You know what I'm saying? It's like how dudes would call like arsenal a bus driver forever like did he really drive a bus nobody knows like it's you just ride with it right so who knows if it's true mm -hmm. but um if it's my boy up there getting roasted like that and it's like i don't think it was that disrespectful but if like things are crossing the line then you're just like eh, maybe we fucked this dude up but you yeah. know anyway i didn't mean to i'm he sorry brought I brought it. Boy, and i guess that's his boy I'm sorry I brought any negativity into the thing. I, no, it's you, definitely not you're negative. A, you're a positive ass dude. Like I, I didn't have any beef. I'm just there as the extra guy. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, you know, it's it's not my situation. I actually saw Soul in Toronto uh, after that. So whatever same event, maybe him and Sketch Menace, whatever that event is. I don't know who I battled. In the Lovelace, maybe? Or HFK, maybe? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I want, it's probably the Uno Labos one, but mm. um, I saw him in the lobby in the hotel and, you know, we just talked, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, hey, I ain't got no problems with you, but you got to see Caustic at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey, it's battle, battle rap, you know, like there are, there's, there was the dark sides and everything like that. That's why Kid Twist, he had a great breakdown of like kind of why he did bodied was his homage to what was right and what was wrong with it, with like the modernization yeah, of everything. Of moments, especially as a battle fan. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I battle too, but I'm clearly a battle fan. Also, there are certain moments that you're like, oh, that's an homage to this. And, you know, there's a lot of references to things that, you know, being part of the culture for so long. Yeah, man. And well, and actually, yeah, like uh, we got a little off, but I want to speak about your return. You're battling a guy named Don Marino, and then you're also going to be in the Cadillac Ron Memorial Royal Rumble at bots. Coming back with two battles all yeah. next to each other. So I got to write for seven people. <laughs> That's fucking wild. After yeah. not doing it for, for five years or whatever it is. Well, Dan actually had me, Dirtbag Dan actually had me booked for the, the Rumble for a while. Okay. Um, and we were just waiting to announce it. And then I battle came in and, and it was done with uh, some other dudes from here called Bear Arms, which is uh, a man, Lou Berra and uh, uh, Amzilla. So they reached out and they were like, hey, we got an idea. We're doing an Orlando event, which is, I'm like, I normally wouldn't want to battle, but it's here. You know what I'm saying? And I, that's the ones that I like. If I can get a good enough opponent, my friends can go, right? Because they don't ever get to go to these shits. They, I mean, they flew out to a couple ones before, but as a whole, I could bring 20 friends versus two that'll fly out to come see me. But uh, 
they had reached out and they announced it like two days after I confirmed it. So I actually, <laughs> I actually had the, the rumble booked for a while and that was going to be the only one that I returned to. And they hit me up and they're like, Hey, we got an idea. Don Marino, what do you think? And I, I was like, damn, that's actually one that I would take. He's from Florida. Also he's from South Florida. I've known Don Marino for a long time uh, since he was Don dollars, man. I've known him, you know, Florida dudes, we all know each other for the most part, or they, they know me. And, you know, we met a couple of times, but he's dope. He's not similar to me, but we're both oversized Spanish dudes. So that helps. And it's just Florida on Florida violence, which I'm okay with because it's not real. You know, we know each other, but I think it would actually be a good match. He's popping now. I used to be popping. I don't matter anymore. He matters now. It's a good, uh, it's a good match to have. Don't ever think that, man. Don't ever think that. I, a big thing that I do. I never took it that seriously, man. <laughs> no, I know, but I just want to tell you uh, what I tell everybody. Well, at least in my eyes, is like what you did is indented in time, especially in history with battle rap and everything. Like, like man, like I rem- dude. I, I think of you. I think I, I think of so many fond memories. I think of watching the I'm Classy music video. I, I think of uh dirtbag Dan show when they used to get you to call in drunk at a club or something. <laughs> like, right. Dude, like you're you're just such an entity of yourself, man. Because you're so funny. You're just you're such a good rat. Like I can tell you come from like the boom bap. Like you knew you're like such a historian in it. And then, but like I always try to flip boom bap references in my battles. And you do the thing is, and I love that. And then right now, as you're saying, you don't take yourself seriously, which is I think partly why you're so amazing and entertaining. So yeah, man, I just want to let you know, but like I'm still like I still I I was watching. uh, you battled the homeless guy uh, just before we uh, we started we started this. With the one outside or the uh, or not outside? They're both outside, but the one in Oakland or the one in New York? The one, the, the New York homeless guy. <laughs> yeah, he kept interrupting all the battles. Like, so I'm like, all right, man, just, do you want to battle? Like, do you want to rap? And they just happened to film it. I was just like, hey, let's do this. I wasn't trying to make fun of him or anything. It's just he kept yelling during the battles. Like, hey, I think he's I'm a rapper. Like, even though he's clearly been smoking pipe all day like hey let's go ahead and do it my friend yeah he's no slaughter rico from philadelphia (laughs) no (laughs) definitely i could tell that maybe he rapped at some point in his life but he had just smoked away all the lyrics in his mind but he was really trying to get them back out (laughs) hey shows to him for trying man yeah he Um, he really did try but yo thank you pulling him from the headphones with no attachment I just want to say thanks for being on and like, is like, uh, other than the battles coming up, man, is there anything you want to promote or speak about? Like, uh, I know like you're, you're releasing your projects. Delicatessen is out now. People should go and listen to that. I got a couple songs coming out. That tits song is coming out. Let's just look for it in every club and it's just have fun with it. Uh, I got a couple more songs dropping. I don't know which one's going to be which, but I'll throw them up online. And I've been writing screenplays this whole pandemic. So somebody buy them. All right. In, in all seriousness, is there any way, like, wh- how would somebody inquire to do that from you? Just hit me on Twitter, at Mr. Madness, or Instagram, at Tony Madness. I'm always there. Not always there, but clearly I could pick up my phone and see someone sent a message. So, you know. Hey, if it, if it wasn't for that, you wouldn't be on. <laughs> my obsession with movies has culminated into finally writing some things. I actually have been working on one for some years, but uh, it's, it's at a point where I feel pretty good about it. So I just... Uh, I want to sell a couple of these because I love movies more than anything, I think. So, yeah, man. And I think you'd be pretty, I think whatever you write would be pretty goddamn good with your opinion on all. I got a pretty good understanding of what's good and what's bad in the movie world. (laughs) Yeah, 100%, man. All right, cool. Well, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again for being on for the listeners. Uh, Next guest is either going to be Real Deal or Fredo, just depending on the time. But, uh, yo, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, shout out to Tony. Uh, look look Tony up on all platforms. Look up his old battles. Look up tits. Not on Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> has two T's just to help you out, all right? Okay. Three T's, uh, excuse me. T-I-T-T-S. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, yo, thanks for the listeners. I'm going to keep Tony on to say thank you. But, uh, yeah, keep tuning in. Appreciate y'all. This is blowing up. We're going to yeah. be, be something someday. <laughs>